wanted to welcome you to Sensory Marketing, How and Why Touch Matters, uh, presented to you by Kevin Averagel. And he is actually the presenter of, um, and the president and founder of the international marketing consulting company, Tactical. And Kevin loves print almost as much as I do. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> He has over four, uh, two decades of experience in successfully selling luxury print with digital embellishments. So we are extremely excited to get and have him share his knowledge with us today. So back to you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I hope this is going to be an interesting session for you guys. Um, a little bit about me is I've spent the past maybe 15, 20 years really in the world of uh, digital embellishments. You know, I have a, a long background. We were uh, back in my my first early days when I was with MGI, we really learned how to create uh, a digital embellishment machine. And that has kind of opened my eyes to the importance of psychology uh, in print. And I'll tell you guys what I mean about that as we go through. But, you know, we, we, we tend to forget whether we're making machines and selling machines or we're making print and selling print. We kind of tend to forget how important uh, what we do is on a just on a deep-seated psychological uh, level and the importance that touch plays uh, in some of the things that we do. So um, today's presentation, which I'm about to share with you guys, is really called about sensory marketing uh, and how and why touch matters. And I think this is important because it doesn't not only about embellishments, as we'll talk about, uh, it covers a large variety of different uh, aspects that comes between your skin and your final product and how that can actually influence people and how that can actually influence uh, different, uh, different behaviors. And I think that's kind of important in terms of what print can do that electronic uh, medias can't do. Uh, so a little bit about us at Tactiful, uh, we are a team that basically uh, works with printers, we work uh, with manufacturers, we work with brands and agencies uh, to really teach them how to leverage embellishment uh, to be able to make uh, money with it and how to market it and how to sell it and how to go to market and how to uh, really show the ROI that pops uh, when you're using these types of technologies. It's still kind of a new market. Uh, it's only about 10, 15 years old. Uh, it's still maturing, it's still in the early majority uh, side of the market, but uh, I think it's a very hot button right now. As we see a lot of people talking, it's a it's an extremely hot button topic in the fact that everybody is kind of talking about how to make print more valuable. COVID, COVID kind of had some of those effects. We saw kind of what COVID did is that, you know, by, by putting a crunch on the paper, uh, by being able to make print now, not a commodity, but more of a more of a high end investment from your marketing budget because print got more expensive, because paper got more expensive. People now have started to think, okay, well, what can I add to that print uh, to help me print? Hi. <laughs> okay. So when we talk about print embellishment, uh, this is still a very vague topic. Nobody can really define print embellishment. Uh, as it is, because it really does uh, apply to a lot of things. So if I were to ask you guys, you know, what do you consider to be print embellishment? Well, some people might say foil, and some people might say lamination, and some people might say die cutting, and some people might say uh, RFID uh, implanting, uh, lots of different ways to kind of uh, uh, um, corral this word that's still in development. I think this is still a term uh, the, the digital embellishment or the print embellishment is still a term that's being defined uh, as we go on. But um, it does mean a whole lot of things to a whole lot of people. And for our little discussion today, and based on the case studies that we're finding and uh, some of the research that's going on, uh, we really are going to be focusing more or less on, let's say, um, things like tactile effects. Uh, metallics, reflectives, uh, coatings, things that shimmer, things that make you want to touch, things that make you want to interact with a piece of paper, whether it's on a shelf uh, or whether it's um, at the mailbox. And, and, and we'll talk about how that can kind of influence your decision. So when we talk about like tactile, it could be tactile raised UV. Uh, some of you that have some of the, uh, the a screen printing press can do this as well. A, a toner press. Uh, that has the clear, uh, some of them are able to do this as well. 
Uh, I know we have people from uh, Kodak, from HP, uh, who are able to do the dimensionality uh, to their inks uh, when it comes to that. And uh, obviously many more, I don't want to uh, piss anybody off. <laughs> uh, but then there's also spot UV and spot UV. Uh, this effect, for example, is a phenomenal effect. It kind of, uh, it was, it could be done offset, obviously. It can also be done uh, with a clear ink. It could be done with the inkjet base. It could be done with a variety of different things. Uh, but spot UV itself as an embellishment is really a way to kind of elevate some key highlights uh, and really kind of push the eye uh, towards uh, what you're looking at. Uh, foil effects are great. Foil effects can range uh, from, a, from a sensory standpoint from uh, printing white on foil paper to actually foil stamping, doing digital foil, uh, using the metallics. There's different laminates out there that kind of recreate uh, what you can do with uh, with with foil effects, um, and the whole point, as we'll talk about, is is all about how do I get people to look at my stuff? How do I get it to jump off? How do I get it to differentiate? And in some cases, how do I get it to to sell at a higher price? And we'll talk about the, the beautiful word called premiumization. Uh, which I think is something that everybody should be kind of looking at from the brand perspective uh, and how that can play. And of course, there's embossing effects. So, so really important is, I'm going to show you just a quick little video. Um, this was me, I think like uh, 45, 50 pounds ago, uh, back when I was uh, at MGI in my early days, we uh, had come up with a machine that did digital 3D embossing. And before I went to market uh, and I was in the marketing department, I wanted to see what people kind of thought about this stuff. And so I'm just going to play you this quick little video and you tell me if you see any... Uh... video yet. So I, I guess some of that audio didn't go through, but the whole purpose was what? The purpose was to show that, you know, we were going through the streets of Paris, showing print to people who were young, who were old, who were black, who were white, uh, all the different uh, possible demographics that have no idea what print is, have no idea who Heidelberg is, has never heard of, uh, of anything. Their first reactions was to engage, to interact, to touch. Uh, and very often, I don't know if you've ever seen an embellished sample or you do, or you provide embellishments yourself, but very often if you show somebody, even if they've been in the industry 50 years, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to start petting the print. And it's a very important reaction to capture because that petting of the print, uh, will then set off a series of, of neuro reactions, uh, that will actually start changing, uh, how they're feeling, and, and we'll talk about that. So how does touch affect the human body? Well, very quickly, when you touch something or somebody, um, just the physical act of touching will release three neurotransmitters. You have oxyto oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. And generally speaking, these are the three uh, uh, transmitters in your brain that are related mm -hmm. to uh, stress relief, uh, anxiety relief and pleasure and so it's important to note that uh, when you have a touchable interactive uh, uh, medium in your hands something that's not just a cold screen and we'll talk about the warmth and the importance of warmth 
uh, in a little bit, which is really interesting, but you have something that has a, a texture in the paper or a laminate that has a soft touch to it, uh, or you have an embellishment that uh, really makes you engage your senses, suddenly now your brain is acting uh, differently uh, than it is uh, on traditional uh, mediums. And I think it's important too, I don't know how many of you guys uh, have kids or have grandkids, um, but you know, I do this test all the time with my son Aaron every time we go to Target, uh, is you know, look at how they position the packaging and the toys. First of all, uh, if you have toys for uh, a four-year-old, they're gonna be at a much lower level on the shelf than obviously a, uh, the toys for the 10-year-olds. But what they all have in common is that they all have messages that say, touch me, feel me, try me, push me, pull me. Uh, you push it, it makes a light, it makes a sound, it makes a noise, it rumbles, it does something. And all of that is really aiming uh, to get people to, to interact, to get kids to touch uh, these toys. Because once they touch the toys, um, they know that very, very quickly, um, actually statistically, we'll talk about exactly how often um, but it's, it's, it's over 60% of the time. They're going to say, mommy, daddy, this is what I want. Please. I want to buy this toy uh, just from touching it. So touch has a very high impact already at a very early level. And when you're that young, you haven't really developed yet the filters necessary, uh, to kind of ward off good marketing. I would say, uh, you, you, you're not looking at the price when you're four or five years old. You're not looking uh, online for reviews. You're just going with your gut instinct. And somewhere, uh, somewhere deep down, there's a primal need to touch uh, uh, when you're examining something. Uh, I know that me, if I'm out clothes shopping, I love to touch the, the material. If I'm out uh, uh, doing these things, I know that even me personally, I still catch myself doing it all the time. And that's really where sensory marketing plays because um, it can not just uh, not just uh, affect your pulse, but also affect what's called effective response. So effective response, a fancy psychological term that basically um, is defined as the general psychological state of your, your current emotion. So right now in this situation, what is your mood? What is your emotion? That is your effective response. And, and that's what print actually has been shown to change is we could change people's moods. We could change their emotions within a given uh, area. And to give you an idea, there's two types of effective response. You have the positive affectivity. So those of you who are sports fans will definitely feel with that. Okay, somebody just scored the game-winning touchdown in the last second to win the national championship or beat your rival. You know that feeling that you get when somebody scored that touchdown uh, and you win that game and, and that, that rush of adrenaline that you have? You are likely to make some stupid decisions when you are in that mood. When you have a high level of positive affectivity, you're very much more susceptible to marketing messages, to spending more money than you had budgeted for. You're very open to making types of mistakes uh, and making lapses in judgment because you have that, um, that positive affectivity uh, going through your brain. Uh, and so that's something that a lot of different, um, I would say a lot of different industries kind of tend to capitalize on. Um, casinos, for example, uh, is a probably one of the best examples once you you know you hit a big hand or your number comes out on the roulette table or you see the craps table and everybody's got this feeling going on because somebody's got a hot mm -hmm. hand you're more likely to to spend more money after uh experiencing that kind of a situation uh than if not so from that standpoint if i can get people in a positive uh in a positive mood get those positive uh, things going, I can probably help influence them to buy my product or or, or to to influence their behavior more uh, than if they were not. But just as equally, and as my fellow Gator fans uh, may understand, uh, it goes the other way as well. So um, you also have what's called negative affectivity. And I want you to reach down and uh, think about that moment where you lost the big game against your rivals or you know you just you you lost in the last seconds that feeling right there also is uh what's called effective response so i'm giving you guys just a little brief 
introduction to psychology so you understand that you know when you are in this kind of a obviously in a mood you're less likely uh, to spend money that you hadn't budgeted for you're less likely to make unplanned purchases you're less likely uh to 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 make make decisions that you typically wouldn't have made uh and so this kind of closes you up and what's important to to notice is that statistically and we'll show you through this touch has been shown to influence both positive and negative affectivity and this is why it's so important guys as printers you know we we need to play the psychological angle because what we do and the choices that we make when we print something uh, and we create a beautiful piece uh, can really make that difference in terms of how do we change affectivity so um yale did the study which is uh, i thought a really interesting study it was called the yale coffee study and for those of you who have never heard of the Yale Coffee Study, essentially what happened was this. Uh, Yale University went out and, and, and asked people to hold a cup of coffee. And half of those coffees were hot and half of those coffees were cold. And then they'd take the coffee back and they'd ask them to read a quick story, a quick paragraph, and answer a couple of questions based on the paragraph. And what they found was really fascinating. They found that those people who had held a hot cup of coffee, when asked, how would you describe the protagonist in the story, would describe him in good terms. So having held that hot cup of coffee, they would, they would describe him as warm, as caring, uh, as a good person. And those had held the cold, uh, cold brew or whatever it was, the, the frappuccino, uh, would answer all the other questions were statistically the same. But when asked, how do you feel about the person, the protagonist in the story, uh, describe them in terms like cold, uh, um, uh, closed, uh, and all kinds of negative connotations on the same exact story that both sets read. And so now suddenly we understood that, you know, if you're ever on a first date, make sure you take him, you know, take him or her out to, to some, some good hot coffee and hopefully you'll get uh, a better reaction. So hot coffee will get people to see you in a better light uh, than holding cold coffee. And I'll get to how print plays into that. But, um, you know, there's a second study, a follow-up study to this that Yale did, and it was called the warmth study. And in this case, uh, the, same, the same group at Yale went around and asked people to hold either a hot pack and or a cold pack. And here, instead of reading a story, they said they would ask them, listen, I have two choices for you guys. The first choice is uh, in, in uh, to thank you for holding this pack, you can either have a gift for yourself or we'll give you a gift certificate that you give to somebody else. And statistically, the people who are holding the warm pack overwhelmingly chose the gift certificate to give to somebody else. Uh, compared to the people who held the cold packs who statistically wanted the gift for themselves. So I thought that was a really interesting uh, kind of lead into where we're headed with this when it comes to especially print. And, and we talk about, I don't know if any of you guys are doing greeting cards, for example. Why are greeting cards always done on uncoated papers? You go uh, to CVS, you go to a Walmart or Target, and you're buying your greeting cards what you'll notice is like 95% like of the greeting cards out there are all on uncoated paper. The reason is because uncoated paper, when you touch it, is warmer to the touch than a C1S or a C2S. It's, it's warmer to touch. It's warmer to feel. When you're sending somebody a greeting, whether it's a good greeting or it's a I'm sorry greeting or it's a uh, whatever it might be, you want to connect on that personal warm level. And that's why some applications, some jobs have always traditionally been run on uncoded materials because these companies who spend a lot of money to understand the psychology of their customers understood uh, that sometimes, for example, if I'm getting a nice new Beats headphones, I'm going to want it looking sleek. I'm going to have it not just coated, but maybe put a soft touch laminate on it, maybe get some bling going so that it really gives me that esteem, luxurious look and feel. Uh, some others will go the other way. They'll go with recycled, they'll go uncoated to kind of create that 
little bit of connection with the person who's holding that box. Uh, but the Yale Warm Study and the, the Yale Coffee Study both show uh, that just holding something and the temperature that that is in your hand can actually change how you feel about things. There's another study with a really good friend of mine. Uh, her name is Joanne Peck. She's a university uh, uh, professor, and she does a lot of work uh, on haptics, which is like the, the touch and the feel. And um, this is around what we call premiumization. So those of you who don't know what premiumization means, uh, very simply means I can take the same product, put it in a nicer looking box, a nicer looking package, and be able to sell it at a higher price than, than the same exact product in, in the normal box. And that's what premiumization is, is how do I get people to spend more with me uh, than, um, than, than, uh, than just my regular, my, my regular packaging. And we'll go through some case studies of people who've done this really well, but um, I think it's important that Joanne did a, a really interesting study uh, where it was all a VR study, right? So it was done during COVID. It just came out a couple of months ago. And she put a VR headset on people. And this VR headset, so we're now starting to talk about how does the digital uh, ecosystem and the metaverse and all that kind of play into what I'm talking about. Uh, really interesting. She went through uh, and created this, this fake store that people had to walk through virtually. And their job is to go walk through the store and buy a red shirt. And the groups were split up into like three separate groups. The first group that was set up was about going in and when they chose the shirt, basically they had like an arrow uh, that would click and the shirt would just end up in their virtual, um, I guess their virtual, uh, what's it called, a bag or, or whatever it is, their shopping bag. Uh, and, and the second people who are walking through uh, when they clicked on it, there was a hand, but the hand didn't do anything, uh, and it would just magically disappear from the shelf into your shopping bag. And the third, um, the third one uh, was actually showed the hands, and you can go out and physically grab the shirt and put it into your bag. And so they ran this with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different people. And what they found was comparing the three groups is the people who had the program where they went in and there was a virtual hand in front of them actually virtually touching the shirt. Touch led to a hot, they were willing, the people who actually virtually touched the shirt were willing to pay 33% higher price than the other two groups for that same shirt. And so I thought that was really interesting that touch not only will affect your ability uh, to feel good or bad about a product based on, on how that responsiveness is. But really importantly, too, it can also affect uh, whether or not you're willing to pay more for the same product uh, than, than others. So again, psychology is very important in the world of print. It's probably one of the most under-talked about points in print. Uh, but when you kind of zoom out and you look at the entire ecosystem of what is a reason of being in the printing industry in many cases it's not just uh, about uh, pushing information or protecting a product it's about vehiculating the right uh, image for the brands and being able to put yourself in a position where you can actually compete um, even with bigger brands that are more well known by playing with really spectacular looking uh, uh, packages, especially those that have been embellished. So, you know, we kind of look at different ways that touch influences uh, print. We look at your paper stock selections. We talked about the uncoated versus uh, the coated or the laminated versus the recycled and, and all these different looks and feels that you're going to get. Um, you're also going to increase and play, and this is Joanne Peck. Uh, if you guys want, I'll send you her her research is really interesting, talks about the perceived value of a brand or a product. And um, and I think some of your members might be in the Illinois, I don't know, uh, Melissa, if they're in the Illinois area, but Illinois actually tried to pass laws where it's illegal for shop owners or shopkeepers or shops, period, to actually pass samples or get people who are walking the street to, let's say I'm trying to sell a phone. I can't hand somebody a phone and say, hey, what do you think of this phone? Because uh, that was deemed to be unfair competition. That's how powerful people realize that the power of touch really is when it comes to sensory marketing.
That's very interesting. We did not know that. And yes, we do have members out that area. Right, right. So I think that's uh, that's really that's that's right on when we talk about what what the the Chicago legislator was trying to to get past is they've seen these reports, they've seen the studies, they understand that touching a product. If I'm if I have a store in the mall and people are walking by, um, it's uh, it's a very powerful sales tool to get people to just touch something, mm -hmm. uh, even uh, if they weren't planning on buying it. And and we see this all the time. Uh, and this is called haptic exploration. Um, we look at haptic exploration, for example. Uh, I think one of the best, uh, one of the best industries when it comes uh, to embellishments and sensory marketing is probably uh, the wine and spirits industry. Um, any of you who have ever been to a liquor store or have been uh, who have bought a bottle of wine, you could see how much work goes into uh, into that label. You know, the label in many cases. You know, it, many people don't know that much about wine. What they're going to pick out is, first of all, they're going to look at the price. Okay, that's my price range. And then, and, and oftentimes they'll pick the best looking label in the price range that they want to sell. So I'm not saying that haptic exploration is the number one reason to sell. It's probably like the number third, three or number four. You know, you have past experiences. You have, a, do I know this brand? Do I know what their values are? Do I know what they feel like? But it's definitely an important one. And it's so important that a study that came out from Mood Media in 2019, when they were asking people, what do you look for? What is, and this was a global study, what is the most important thing for you when you go shopping in a retail environment? The first 43%, number one was, can I touch the products? Number two was, were there new products in stock? Is it the newest stuff or is it old stuff? And number three, what is the overall vibe of the atmosphere uh, of that actual store. So we know that the ability to touch, think of it as a, as a consumer. Don't always think of it as a printer or as an OEM. Think of it as a consumer yourself. When you go to a store, what stores do you like and why and does touch have anything to do with any of that? And so I think haptic exploration is an important one. And those who do this the best when it comes to haptic exploration, understand that before I touch something, what do I need to do? I need to see it. And that is more important. First of all, if I'm walking through a store, I'm going through my stack of mail in front of my recycling bin, and I'm going, okay, garbage, 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 garbage. Huh, that's cool. And I might still throw it away, but that two, three moments, I think people are calling that the mail moment. Those two or three seconds were, huh, that's cool. That's what the brand's looking for. That's what they're trying to do uh, is to try to get you to see what they're doing. And then if you see it and you touch it, uh, then we'll see what the statistics look like. Uh, but we know that if you put, for example, sensory embellishments on packaging, uh, you guys are, might be familiar with uh, Clemson University. They do a lot of really cool studies when it comes to print, but especially with eye tracking. Uh, study. So they have like this fake 7-Eleven, this fake store where they test out new products. And basically they funnel students through there with these specialized glasses that kind of can track where their eyes are looking and what they're doing. And what they determined was those ha that had, for example, uh, high visibility in, in uh, embellishments, so things like foil and, and tactile varnishes, uh, were people were able to uh, what's called TFD, total fixation dura uh, uh, duration, uh, it was long, they looked at the product longer, almost 50% longer to the products that were embellished on the shelf compared to all the other product products, even if the other store products had a bigger brand or more, were more well known. Uh, and then 46% of these guys that were, uh, that were uh, mm -hmm. studied said that they preferred, obviously, uh, they said th they thought that the packages with the embellishments were a higher quality product uh, than those that didn't. And it's a kind of a funny story. I mean, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but there's a there's a company that that really did uh, did a fantastic thing on this. It was called the the Zapotec. And those of you who have never heard of Zapotec, uh, it's probably for a good reason because it doesn't exist. Zapotec is a fake coffee company that was invented. And what they did is that they took this fake coffee, and they put red foil and gold foil and enhancements. Uh, and then they stuck it next to like Morning Choice and Folgers and Nestle and uh, all the, the very famous brands who spent billions of dollars 
uh, in, 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 in turnover. And what they found was people looked more at the packaging uh, from the Zapotec coffee than they did to the traditional ones uh, and the ones that they knew. So what this means is that if I'm, I'm a smaller brand or I'm, a, I'm not a billion dollar brand, I'm not even a, a million dollar brand, but I'm on a shelf somewhere somehow, if I want to fight against the big guys, one of the easiest and quickest hacks is to really invest into my packaging to get those high visibility enhancements done uh, because I could very quickly now compete for eye space and eye share <laughs> uh, compared to the bigger brands who are out there just because um, just because I'm going to basically I'm going to refract the light in a way that they aren't and the idea is what if I refract the light if I'm walking down the stair and I see something refracting the light and it looks cool and it makes me want to touch like we saw in that video when I was young walking around and people are out there touching we know that when you touch something, you get a significantly higher bump in sales and especially in impulse purchases. So, so really when it comes to embellishments in a retail environment is embellishments help you, number one, see the product on the shelf. And number two, it makes you want to touch it. And if I see it and I touch it, chances are I'm going to buy it. And it's this is like a, a microphone drop stat right here, but... 62% of people who this pick up, hello? Oh, 62% of the people who, um, who pick up a product in the store will buy that product on an impulse purchase. And I want you to think, 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 think every time you go shopping, every time you're, you're out there and you're buying something, how often do you pick something up off the shelf, look at it, and put it back. Uh, well, according to these studies that came out um, by the FSCA, uh, that's probably less than 40% of the time. 60% of the time or 62% of the time, you're actually gonna make that purchase. And you're gonna trigger what's called an impulse purchase because you were able to get somebody to touch your product. And so this is a really well hidden, again, remember the brands and the agencies don't necessarily want you guys to know this information, uh, uh, this is really information that they've spent a lot of money uh, to, to, to get to understand. And, and, and this is why they, they, they are, that's why you see a lot of these, especially when it comes to uh, luxury companies and you high end people who are trying to position for the high end uh, are going to really invest into high end packaging. Now, it's really important because this is a great slide. I love this. this is, the head really does justify what the heart decides. And, and, and the many times when you're doing that shopping, your heart's going to say, oh, this is cool. I really want to try this. Um, I feel connected, whether it's the packaging or it's the design or it's where it's from or whatever it might be. Uh, you might have heard about it. You know, there's a lot of different things that go into that purchasing decision. But the mind always has a very funny way of kind of rationalizing, okay, yeah, this is why you, this is why we could make this work. This is... This is that conversation that everybody has internally when they're in front of something they're about to buy or something that they're looking at, uh, whether it's a car or it's a house or it could be anything. Um, I think all of us can relate to that. And so the buying psychology and the buying rationale um, is always emotions will get you to, to, to do actions and, 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 and thinking won't. So I think that's one of the key things that came out. Uh, of a lot of the studies that we're, we're looking at is that if you're able to hit somebody on an emotional level and an emotional cell uh, by getting them to touch, getting to change their positive affectivity, uh, getting to understand um, what you're trying to do and trying to connect with that brand from a physical standpoint, uh, this is where these, these can really play. And those who do it the best uh, is what's called a good combination of haptic texture and visual texture. And so both of those words, haptic texture and visual texture, have the word texture in it, um, but one is haptic, meaning that's how it feels, and one is visual is how it looks. Those who really get embellishment right understand how to marry the two so that it looks like it would feel this way. And when I touch it, that's exactly how I thought it was gonna feel. And those are the ones that actually, from a design standpoint, uh, have the highest rate of sale, or highest rate of uh, 
uh, of success is when you can actually make an orange vodka label look like an actual orange. Or for example, uh, this was a great, this was an award-winning package in Europe. I'm sure many of you guys have seen this. Um, and this won a lot of uh, awards and a lot of, and, and significant increase in sale, sales. But what was kind of cool is like you would walk by and you would see this and it would look like, and they're selling nuts basically. And so the premise is this looks like a, a squirrel's dre. And yes, it's called a dre. I didn't know that. I had to Google it before this presentation. And that's where squirrels live inside the, that's basically their nest. It's called a dre. And so basically they made it look like a squirrel's dre. And the idea behind making it look like a squirrel's race, it would look organic, it would look clean, it doesn't look processed, it doesn't look, but it looks natural, it looks like wood, and when I got up and I actually touched it, guess what, it actually felt like wood too. And so being able to combine that visual with the actual uh, haptic and making those two marry correctly uh, so that people aren't confused, like, oh, this this looks like it feels like wood and I touch and it feels like plastic. Uh, that That's going to throw your brain for, a, even on the subconscious level, it's going to th uh, throw your brain for a loop. So uh, remember, you know, the design aspect and designing for, uh, for textures and designing for embellishments uh, when it comes to sensory marketing, if there is no story to tell, if there is no connection between how it feels and how it looks, uh, you're going to have a tougher time selling that product off the shell, shelf than if 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 they actually do have uh, some sort of a connection. And so we kind of look at some of the different major uh, players that have uh, been very successful when it comes to using sensory embellishments. Uh, the first one was Colgate. And so it's kind of fun because Colgate was like number three or number four uh, in number, uh, in in 1997. And then uh, some guy at Colgate or some girl at Colgate came up with the idea, hey, you know what? We're going to put foil. And they did a cold foil packaging. And guess what happened? Inside of four months, they went from number four to number one and grabbed 30% market share. And the idea here was what? It was if this box is so shiny, I bet you the toothpaste inside will make my teeth just as shiny that was more or less the uh the the premise for putting foil make it shiny so that people think that if the box sparkles so will your so will your teeth and, and it worked and now guys please next time you go out and you buy any kind of toothpaste look at the toothpaste aisle and tell me if there's a single toothpaste that does not utilize some kind of foil embellishment uh, on their actual boxes or some kind of a metallic or something uh, to make you think, oh, well, this is shiny too. I'm sure this will make my teeth just as shiny as the Colgate. And so basically now that's kind of altered the whole standard of packaging and, and all the oral care uh, is really, and you have these you have these markets, like you have spirits, like they're all about the bling and you have a uh, toothpaste. They're all about the bling. There's all these different markets that kind of stumbled upon it by accident. Uh, and one of them, one of the biggest ones was Gillette. Now, I don't know if uh, uh, you guys remember, but you know, obviously razors before 1998, I remember the big razors, the, the blue ones, um and and that was really what most people were using now all of a sudden Gillette came out with this reusable um uh model the razor and razor blade model uh and nobody thought it was going to work uh and one of the main reasons nobody thought it was going to work was who's going to spend that much money on razor blades and, and oh my god these things are so expensive like every time i buy them i'm just like how am i spending this much money on uh on uh, on on Gillette uh, mock razors and uh and their whole idea was they decided to now put foil on their box when they launched foil everywhere if you look at gillette they're a big user of foil and the idea was by putting foil they were able to position razors as a luxury item uh compared to a commodity item it's just good market and so they spent a little bit extra they did a little bit uh, they spent some more money on their box than their competitors, but they were then able to basically create uh, a market where now they have such an overwhelming market share uh, of razors because of what's going on. 
We see the same thing with Zantac. Zantac uh, in 1983, uh, they were competing against uh, a product uh, for, uh, what was this, anti-acid. It was over-the-counter anti-acid. They were competing against the product. The people who created this product, the competitors, were Nobel Prize winning. They had just won the Nobel Prize for figuring out a way to do over-the-counter uh, anti-acid. And they were able to beat them out by putting foil all over it, positioning it as a high-end product, even though it's probably an inferior product at the time. Uh, and basically, if you look at over-the-care product, over-the-counter the products today, very similar story. Just like the, the toothpaste, you're going to see uh, a high level. Think about your Advil. Even the labels on Advil are printed on foil board or there's cold foil somewhere. There's a use of foil to differentiate in these categories, kind of like golf balls too. I mean, same thing when, when it comes to different uh, very niche markets that, that really have taken off. Um, and then the last one that I have for you guys is, you know, there's a company called Best Choice Private Labels. Uh, and one day, somebody in the marketing department said, hey, you know what, let's put gold foil stamping on the olive oil that we have, the Best Choice Olive Oil. And immediately, they experienced a 30% jump in velocity. So immediately, as soon as that foil went on, people started buying it, 30% higher rate. Uh, and then they kept 15, 10 to 15% of those clients that had tried it for the first time. So uh, uh, what ended up happening is uh, Best Choice was owned by a major company called Associate AWG, so Associate Wholesale Gro Groceries, and they started, they've paid attention, they saw what happened, and then between 2004 and 2008, made a concerted effort to put foil on more of their products uh, and increase their sales by almost 50%. So um, again, the, the positioning, because they're able to get people's attention when they're walking through the, uh, when they're walking through the, um, the hall or they're walking through the store and they pick something up because something's really gotten their attention and then they've touched it, 62% higher chance of buying. And then 10 to 15% of those people kept the product, which is pretty cool. So a lot of you guys are probably thinking through this whole presentation, Kev, 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 this is great, but but I don't go to the store anymore. Everything I buy is online. Everything I do is virtual. I basically, Amazon comes to my, pack, to my, my front door three times a day. Um, I know, I feel the same thing. Um, and what's important to know is that when it comes to uh, this whole situation is that the metaverse and touch is also something that has been shown to work, meaning that they have, for example, the same person at University of Wisconsin, uh, Joanne Peck, ran a study. Uh, and this was part of that same study with the VR, by the way. Uh, and this study basically said uh, that they, they studied companies who put out Instagram ads and the company and they split it basically half the half the 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 ads had no hands in it, just the product. And the other uh, set of products had somebody holding that product. There was a hand in that picture. And what they found was that the pictures that had hands in it received an average of 65% more likes and engagements than those that didn't. So even you thinking about touching a product or seeing somebody touch a product has some, some kind of an effect on uh, on marketing. And then so finally, these are kind of like the, the, the different types of embellishments we talked about, but there's also a very interesting new part of what's happening. It's called uh, functional embellishments. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but functional embellishments is instead of looking pretty or getting my attention or making me feel all warm and fuzzy when I touch your bot, you know, the, your packet or whatever it is, uh, what it does, it actually has a purpose, a functional purpose. Uh, so some of them are, for example, I don't know if you're following universal design, but some people are using um, raised symbols. So this is, a, uh, this is a, a client of mine, actually, who's using raised varnish, putting it on her uh, uh, beauty line. So this is uh, Victoria Land Beauty. And the idea is that if you are in the shower and... Uh, you don't have your glasses on or you have soap in your in your eyes and you go to grab the shampoo, but you're actually putting the conditioner on. How do you tell the difference? Or I don't have my glasses. And is this day quill or is this night quill? Is this day mask or is this night mask? So she's actually going and creating what's called 
it's basically think of it as a, a braille emojis uh to to kind of simplify braille for people who are not just 100 percent blind but just people who wear glasses and don't have them on them uh, all the time so that you can use actual embellishments uh, to communicate what the actual product is inside their hands and procter and gamble really cool just recently if you go out and you look at any herbal essence uh product uh all of their um their shampoos if you look at the back will have uh, four raised lines. So you can just grab that and touch it and you can feel it. And, and now really quickly, instead of uh, using the conditioner, you know, you have the shampoo. And then if you want the conditioner, it's, it's six raised dots um, that will tell you immediately what kind of product you have in your hand. And so that's kind of where embellishments kind of go away from just the sensory marketing and trying to get people to buy your product. Now they've bought your product. How do you make it easy to identify the product in a situation where maybe uh, you're not seeing so well, maybe there's a light, you know, you can't see anything because of the light, or maybe you have uh, a visual disability. So really cool stuff. And probably one of my favorite uh, uh, functional embellishments that I've ever seen. Um, I figured this out, I found out about this actually when I was in, 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 uh, in Las Vegas was uh, if you look at any card, and I kind of zoomed in there so you can kind of see what the texture is, but any playing card, you can buy them, they say has air cushion technology on it. And I don't know if you guys can imagine or guess what that air cushion uh, technology is. A lot of people say, oh, it's so I can grip it better, or I can feel it better, or the whole idea is that when I slide that card across the, the playing table, See all those little squares will actually create air pockets. And these air pockets will help uh, the, the, um, uh, the card slide faster across the table. Now, why do you think that casinos and every casino is using air cushion technology? Why do you think casinos would be interesting, interested in using this technology? Well, because obviously in one minute, they can get 42% more hands dealt uh, during a minute than, than just regular cards. So now all of a sudden they're speeding up the game and they're almost doubling the amount of gains that they can inside a minute just by using really interesting functional embellishments uh, that can really, uh, uh, I guess, change their business. Uh, as simple as that. Uh, so there's a lot of different technologies that are out there. I'd be more than happy to kind of walk you guys through it uh, when it comes to foil you know, you have the whole analog side with, you know, hot stamping, cold foil, um, uh, screen printing technology, you have white on foil board, you have metallic inks. Inkjet is a really interesting uh, market. That's really where I have a lot of my background was uh, through the inkjet side. So you have the rays and you have the flat foils. And then obviously you have the toners and, and inks uh, who are using anything from sleeking, uh, which is basically reheating uh, black uh, or whatever CMYK toner uh, that will melt uh, to uh, to foil uh, to actual metallic toners themselves, or even white ink or toner onto foil boards to create these really cool looking masks. Um, and then obviously, you know, depending on where you are and what your budget is, there's really a, a, there's an entry point for embellishments for everybody, uh, no matter what your budget is. There is literally one or another way to get into it uh and and depending on what your needs are and what your clients needs are and what your market and what your applications are looking for there are lots of entry level mid and high level ways to get uh to get into this business and really the same thing comes down to the varnish and the reflective effects um you know very similar you have lots of different uh entry points uh to get in there from a, a pricing standpoint so uh, guys, remember, print is the most touchable marketing medium there is in the world. There's no nothing more touchable other than somebody coming to your door, shaking your hand, saying, hey, buy my product. Uh, uh, print is really going to be, is the most market, most touchable marketing medium uh, in the world. And, and please, 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 my, my one ask of you is start incorporating psychology in your sales uh, discourse, when you're talking with your clients, when you're talking with your agencies, talk about the importance of touch, talk about uh, just how far uh, the ROI can go uh, if you started to uh, incorporate these types of embellishments into, um, into your everyday print. 
So guys, that's uh, that's all I got for you today. If you guys have any questions, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, oh, ask. They got something on the slide there. So um, everybody, I did see a question in the chat. And okay. uh, yes, uh, is will the presentation be shareable? It absolutely will be. I will be sending everybody who registered the recording. Uh, Kevin was gracious enough to share that. And please um, tune in to our calendar of events on uh, graphicartsassociation.org or your local APAN chapters website. And we're sure to have Kevin back and his team to do other presentations and informative sessions. So really appreciate everything, Kevin. All right. Well, thank you very much. And please, if there's anything that uh, that you guys want to know more, you know, we have an awesome YouTube channel that you can subscribe to. We have really cool videos with brands, with agencies, with users, with uh, even my seven-year-old kid has his own channel where he just unboxes really cool looking samples. And it's kind of fun to see that, that reaction. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. If you guys have any questions whatsoever, uh, just reach out at tactiful.com. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody. And we will send this presentation off to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,